recording of this public event. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, we see you joining our event, and I think some people are still connecting on video and audio. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for our monthly TEFL workshop. My name is Lauren Sakakibara, and I am a program coordinator for the ESL and TEFL programs at the Division of Continuing Education. And we're so uh, glad that you're able to join us uh, today for this workshop. Um, I recognize some names and maybe some of you are familiar with our monthly events where uh, every month we have one of our instructors at DCE do a little workshop on a different topic related to TEFL, teaching English as a foreign language. Um, and so for today's workshop, we have one of our wonderful instructors, Alison Walter, and she will be giving um, a lesson on how to teach speaking as a teacher. Um, so please, please uh, feel free to uh, ask her you know, any questions during the, during the lesson. And also if you um, are more comfortable with typing a question or comment in the chat, please feel free to do that at any time. And um, I will be watching the chat as well. So um, without any further ado, I will pass it over to Allison. Thank you. Well, thanks, Lauren. I really appreciate it. Um, that was a very nice and warm welcome. So the focus today is teaching speaking. And this is, I'm going to first talk a little bit about myself and then talk about six guidelines for a successful speaking class, specifically how to create a good speaking activity. I'm going to focus on four key guidelines, and then I will be uh, giving you a speaking activity to do in breakout rooms. Afterwards, we'll have a few questions and answers, but I am open. I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have during the presentation. All right, here we go. So very quickly, a little bit about me. I have been teaching for over 30 years. I've got really good filters on Zoom right now. I teach languages and humanities. Humanities is a mixture of literature, art, poetry, historical documents. And I've been teaching at UCI for oh, about 15 years and in high schools and universities in the United States and in Europe. I have a PhD in French literature and philosophy, certificate in TEFL, and also a certificate in online teaching specifically with Canvas. Any questions? All right, if you do, just ask. So, the six guidelines for building a successful speaking activity. I'd like to go over these, but actually the first rule for any speaking class, which I'm sure you probably already know, is there's this secret. Students, not the teacher, should do the talking. And that's what is so important about building a great speaking activity. So the first step in building a good speaking activity is knowing your students, knowing your class. What are the demographics that are key to understanding what your students expect and what you expect? So what does that mean? So do I have a classroom where everyone speaks the same language? Do I have a classroom where I have technology? Or do I have a classroom filled with people from different countries, different cultures with different languages? With those in mind, I can start thinking about how I'm going to teach speaking. The second guideline is I need to know my learner. I need to know who's learning the language, their age, what's their level, and what they really want to do 
with English. So, you know, you need to find out, are they interested in only going to a university? Are they interested in traveling and getting to know people using English? Am I teaching a group of, of middle school students or high school students? Are they interested only in taking a test so they can go on to a university in their own country? All of these things I need to know as a teacher to create a really good speaking activity. The third one is, this is obvious. You need a good textbook and you need to know what your school says you are going to teach. What's the curriculum? We'll move on with that. That's like a whole nother workshop right there. Also, you want to select a really good topic. So a topic that fits your classroom, fits your student, your learner, and also uses the textbook and is satisfying the curriculum from the school. Now, the, the fifth one, this is going to be a big part of what we'll be doing, is understanding the two languages of a speaking activity. There are the languages in the task that we are learning and the languages, the language for the task that our students need to complete the task. We'll talk more about that took me a moment uh, when I uh, started teaching to understand what those two things are. So then let me see, there we go. And this is a really key, something that we teachers sometimes don't always do. We need to have a specific task for our students, a goal, some sort of, you know, not something too open, it's got to be very focused. They feel better and they feel more accomplished after they finish the task. And we teachers feel like, yes, they learned that today. So we're going to be looking at four of these guidelines, the demographics, the learner, the languages, and the specific task. Does anybody have any questions? No questions so far. <laughs> All right, sounds good, okay. All right, here we go. So let's take a look at this speaking activity. So we have this speaking activity and it looks like we're looking at geography about South America. We want to know, you know, we want our students to talk about the population of certain countries in um, South America. We want them to do some pair work, working with another classmate, and to discuss, you know, any differences between their answers. And they don't want to just show the paper, like just answer everything, go, okay, here are my answers. We want our students to talk, right? Now, how would you get your class started? I mean, sometimes the teacher will come in and maybe you have had teachers like this come in and say, turn to page 36 and work with your classmate on speaking activity three. Kind of like if you know Harry Potter, Professor Snape, when he was a little bit angry and he had to take over a class, just do the book work. Probably that's not going to engage our students very much, right? Instead, we want to get our class interested. We want to set them up perhaps with a challenge. Can you name 10 countries in South America? Work with your neighbor to come up with as many countries as you can in two minutes. Give them a little bit of curiosity. Oh, do I know? I mean, this is all in English too. So they have to sort of, you know, talk to each other and write down as many countries as they can. 
And then they're a little bit more engaged with what they have to do with the speaking task. Now, your students have their lists. How do we get the answers from a class with students from Saudi Arabia, from Japan, from France? I have to say it's terrific when we have a mixed class because we know everyone's going to speak English, but we still have to understand our students. How do I get that information from my students easily? So perhaps from Saudi Arabia, I would ask, well, what countries do you have? And I would turn and I would start, they would start talking. I wouldn't have to call on them. And I would write the countries on the board. That way I can correct the spelling and we can check the answers all together. Generally, that's what I would do if I had, if I were teaching Saudis. If I were teaching Japanese students, I might call on specific students to give the name of a country, and then I would write it on the board. Or I might have a relay race at the whiteboard, the chalkboard, the whiteboard. You know, they would have another competition who can write the most countries on the board. They've already thought about it, they've planned, and now they're writing them on the board. Or if I'm teaching online, I can do this on in any class, right? If it's online, I can have students anonymously write their lists on a Google Doc. Now, that's how I would do it in Japan. You see, it's different from Saudis and Japanese students. Now in France, I would probably ask, what countries do you have? I would write it on the board. No need to call names. I don't think they'd like a relay race. The Saudis, I know they would like a relay race. I know that possibly my Japanese students would like to get out of their chairs, but maybe not so much in France. I have to think about my students and think of how they will be most comfortable in producing language. My second consideration is I have to think about the learner. I have to think about the age, their proficiency, and very particularly their goals. Why are they sitting in my classroom? So imagine an advanced class. I am teaching students who are focused on getting into an American university. That means that they have to pass the TOEFL or the IELTS. I arrive with a football helmet and an American football. I, I put this in, I'm sorry, I put this in third person and I'm talking about myself. I'll go ahead and speak in third person. So let's imagine the teacher, he says, okay, what do you guys know about American football? Well, after a few comments, May he'll write on the board, American football is more difficult to play than soccer. Discuss for 15 minutes. Oh my gosh. How do you think those students feel? We're talking about international students learning English. What do they know about American football? Maybe a little. Now, what actually happened, this is an actual situ situation. The students talked a little bit about soccer and then other sports to finally what they were doing after class. And some students started talking in their, their own languages. Nobody was really engaged. Nobody was very interested in American football. So what did the teacher miss? He didn't think about the goals and what's important or the relevancy to the students and class. That's really important. He thought American football was important, but the students don't understand why. They need to think it's important. So one way would be to start by saying, 
Everyone here is working hard to pass the TOEFL, but after you pass, as I know you all will, what do you know about life at the university? Most American universities are big on American football, and you need to know something about the sport to feel comfortable. So here the teacher took TOEFL and he attached it to the goals of the students. Now that makes the students more interested. Ah, oh, something I need to know to be successful at university. Then afterwards, we need to plan a specific task, give some vocabulary, maybe gap exercise. Maybe a football throwing lesson with a competition who can throw it the best. Something to really get the students thinking, but also speaking in English. Well, maybe not the football throwing lesson. That's fun. Now, this is probably extremely important. The two languages for a speaking task. We have in the task, and for the task. So we're going to go back to our geography speaking task. Now, I as a teacher, I want the students to use the superlatives and comparatives, as well as explain and negotiate their answers when doing the speaking activity. So I have a clear idea of what I want them to do. Now, I look at it and I'm going to say, well, I need a vocabulary list to pre-teach to the students. Can you guys give me some words that you think I should teach to the students? Can you type some in the chat, please? So we're looking at the speaking activity here on this side. What words? Yes, geography. Absolutely, we need geography. What else do we need our students to know? Yes, population. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren, population. Continent, where they're located, maybe show a map, right? Uh, this is South America, right? That would be important too. What's another place? That's some other words we could use. Nationality, that would be good, very good. Those are excellent. I didn't think of nationality. I did think of the map and I was like, mm, how can I fit that in here? But I was thinking geography. So thank you, Maria. Population. Thank you, Lauren. Rank. Those, I have to tell you something about small words in English. You probably already know. The big words like population, um, uh, those big words, usually our students know them, dictionary, but little words like rank, uh, note, uh, that those are the hardest ones to, uh, to um, expect our students to know. But I also remember my task was to teach superlatives and comparatives. So I really need to give them the smallest and the biggest, smaller, bigger. Okay, it's a good list, right? Not so bad. Now let's see, I've taught the list to my students and now I have a, uh, oh, 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 oh. now I'm going to have them talk about it. This is an actual conversation that the students had. So I'm going to read it to you, A. I think Argentina is number one, Bolivia is number two, and Colombia is number three. Wait, say again. Okay. Argentina is number one, 
Bolivia is number, you think that Argentina is the big one? Yes, I think it is very big, the people in Argentina. Sure is number one. Really? I'm not agree with, what were you right for Argentina? Argentina is number four? No, Argentina is number one, is the biggest. I think Colombia is number one. I went Colombia one time, has many people, really a lot. I'm not sure. I still think that Argentina population is more big than Colombia. So I gave a list of vocabulary, but are my students really using the superlatives and the comparatives? Not really. I am missing something. I, I am, as a teacher, I am not doing my job. I have to help them to be more successful. So what I'm going to be doing, let me get back here. I'm going to have to, add a little bit. I need to add that second language, the for the task language. So let's go back to that uh, conversation here. And I should probably give them a table like this. Some of our textbooks will provide us with great tables. Here I've got my vocabulary. I also give them a little bit of a structure for the Superlative. Superlative is, can be kind of mm, challenging. We have the, we add est. And then I have for the task. And this is really helpful. Something with my students I would go over before I put them into pairs. I think that Argentina is bigger. I'm sure that Colombia is bigger. Are you sure that, what did you put for? And I give them sentence structures so my students can be more successful. This is something that's even helpful for high level students, especially if they're trying to improve their grammar and they're trying to make, to use more sophisticated sentence structures we can definitely give them language for the task to make them more successful. All right, any questions there? Let me just, uh, you know, just in case you're interested, I am going to go ahead and give you this in the chat if you want to make a copy of it. There you go. And so you're able to use that. You can see this is not a good conversation. This conversation is lacking the good language I want as a teacher, my students to use. So if I use both language in and for, my students will be more successful. So for beginner students, Language for the task is essential, extremely important. You want to make it a short list for beginner students. So for example, for beginner students, let's see, I would say, I think that, and I would put, oh, not beggar, bigger. <laughs> bigger than the population, I would keep that. Maybe not wait a minute, or actually I would take this one out. I would keep my language for the task much shorter. For students that who are more advanced, you can give that more of a selection. Beginner students, you, you want, if you give more than five, it can be a challenge and make sure to practice in class before you put them in pairs. We're going to practice a little bit, you know, have you be what, you know, the teacher will be the one who's asking and also answering questions. Modeling. 
I hope that answered your question, Twani. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So I really think that these two languages are extremely important. And again, a good textbook will help. Um, but not all textbooks will give you the for the task language. So we teachers have to come up with it. All right. And uh, Twani, I have a, a great activity later on for that's good for beginners as well as advanced students, which we'll be doing in class. All right. And actually, here we are. We're at it. 20 questions. This is a great speaking activity for all levels. It's good for pairs, small groups, or whole classes. Um, I like it. I use it often when I teach a an advanced sort of um, uh, advanced intermediate class about DNA. And but I like the simplicity, how easy this task is or activity. So let me go ahead and give you this copy and then I'll show you how I have it online as well as you'll have your own copy here. There you go. You can make a copy of that and I will show you what it is right here. So I always struggle with my instructions for my students. I want to make them perfectly clear and I, I hope I'm always revising them. As you can see for the 20 questions, so I give some instructions. Those will be instructions for you as well. I'm going to put you into breakout rooms. Here I give my vocabulary. And then I give some sample questions. On the second page, I have a table of faces. So at this point, I would, you know, make sure that to familiarize the faces and the uh, characteristics of these faces with my students. Let me show you how I did this also online. It's very similar. So I was able to, uh, if you, you know, teaching online is really important and Canvas, Moodle, um, those are the two largest and Google Classroom as well. They make this very easy for us to put all these worksheets directly online. If you use uh, Canvas, this is uh, pages over here on the side. Or you can make a link to the speaking activity I just gave you. So here, and you can see this was for my uh, advanced intermediate DNA. We did a whole unit, a whole week on DNA. So what I'd like to do here, let me go back to my worksheet. Uh, okay, there we go. All right. So right now, I am looking at, oh, I did forget one piece. If you wanted to, you can also add intonation to your questions. Since they're all yes, no, they're all going to go up at the end. And you might want to emphasize that for your students, that all those questions are going to rise at the end. All right, so now it's my turn. I'm going to choose one of these faces and you can type in the chat or you can ask directly a question. So remember that you can use 
try to try to pretend you're the you're the um, the student in your classroom. Um, no, I don't have a beard or I don't have a beard or this person doesn't have a beard. <laughs> mm, yes, this person is smiling. No, this person is not angry. There are a few people who are very angry there, but no. No, <laughs> no, this person is not wearing a green beret. That would be 20, but no, good question. Uh, no, this person is not wearing glasses. Oh no, goodbye, Jacob. No, oh, that's good, lipstick. No, uh, uh, I'm not wearing lipstick, I don't think. Well, I am, but the person isn't. <laughs> no, no, uh, no, no, no. This person is not wearing a flower hat. That's a really good one. That would be this person here. No, I don't have blonde hair. Take out all those blonde haired people. Any other question? No. This person does not have white hair. No, this person is not wearing a hat. No, this person doesn't have black hair. And no, this person doesn't have brown hair. So we have no black hair, no brown hair, no blonde hair, no white hair. <laughs> Bald. No. Uh, no, this person does not have a mustache. <laughs> That's right, Maria. It could be. Oh, I shouldn't say anything. I can't say anything. <laughs> mm. uh, no. Oh, no. But can I just say you're close? But no. I do not have pink cheeks or the person doesn't have pink cheeks or he doesn't have pink cheeks. Yes, he has a big nose, <laughs> I know. <laughs> So which one? Can anybody guess? No. <laughs> no, but he probably should. <laughs> no, I'm not a, he, the person is not a woman. He is not a woman.
Maria, you said the word. You said the word. I saw you saying it. Yes, Kumiko, yes. <laughs> the dark horse coming from behind. Good job. Now there we might have tweaked it a little bit, making sure we could make it just you, do you have, you know, that's how sometimes we play it in uh, the classroom. We'll have like a picture at our forehead and we have to go around and ask questions, right? Um, this is one that's very easy to adapt online, just in case that we all hope we don't have to be teaching online all the time. But this is a, a, an, an easy, adaptable activity. Thank you, Twenty, And great for all levels. And I'm sure you'll be able to adapt this to your beginners to help with that, just the um, conjugation of those verbs as well. All right, so I would like to, I'm, I think what I'm going to do is uh, I'm actually going to open it up to any questions and answers. I know with, I would love to do breakout rooms, but we'll probably go over time. And some of you are, it's really, I know some of you are in China and Japan and it's very, very early in the morning for you. <laughs> And for some of you who are in South America or you're in Europe, wherever you are, uh, I know that I really am happy that you're here with us today. Do you have any questions for me? I'll take you back to Q&A. Let me do a, just a quick, I wanted to also tell you one of my favorite books and I got much of my information and much, uh, uh, much of my information for this presentation from this book. And it is The Art of Teaching Speaking by Keith S. Fulsey. He's a very prominent uh, ESL, EFL uh, writer, uh, educator in the United States. And I strongly recommend his, um, his um, books. He also does these great textbooks. I don't know him personally. I'm not promoting him, but I'm just making sure that you know the information I gave you is not entirely mine, but I learned from him and I should, I should just present this book to you. This book is a little old. It might have changed the cover. The cover might have been different. This is like, this is like 20 years old. <laughs> so thank you. And in the book itself, there are a lot of great activities that um, he offers up and gives uh, good advice. There's also a section on how to assess or evaluate speaking. Um, most of the activities are, uh, are very fun and adaptable. Digital sources. I could go on and on, Tuani. I love... <laughs> uh, let, me, uh, let me start with some... Uh, well, I like, I like the free or the cheaper ones. And um, you probably are familiar with quite a few. So Google Docs, just as I have uh, just shared with you some of my uh, this activity. One trick that I'd like to, if you don't know it already, is when you go over here and you share. OK, can you guys see my share my share boxes here? And when you click on OK, you need to change your link. You make it editor. Make sure you copy the link and done now. When you have that, you need to, I, you know what, I'm going to just open up another document so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Oop, it didn't work. Okay, I'm going the long way. Here we are. All right, 
and I'll make this larger. I find that Google Docs, it's really, um, it's my whiteboard. So this is the share uh, address. Now you'll see here, um, let me make it a little bit smaller so it's easier for you to understand what I'm saying here. Um, okay, when you see this word edit, you go in and if you already know this, that's terrific. You put in copy and you can share that with anybody and they can make their own personal copy. Uh, what I like is that um, my students were struggling, you know, I wanted to keep, I wanted to keep this mine, right? The master copy. But my students would forget to copy it, would go, wouldn't go over and do file, make a copy, and they would just start writing on my master copy. So I was really happy when I learned about this little trick. I just take out edit, put in copy, and my students, like you did, can make their own copies. Another digital source that I like is you're probably familiar with Kahoot, right? Yeah, Kahoot, I think is terrific. It's a fun way to do things. They've uh, dressed it up a little bit, but uh, I think essentially, even when it's free, it's so fun and the students just love it. Another one that I like, I have a ton of Kahoot's. Another one I like that um, maybe you know, maybe you don't, is Jeopardy Labs. Jeopardy Labs is just terrific. You can create your own Jeopardy game, or you can find your own Jeopardy game. So I've used mine. Uh, I taught the novel Number the Stars. Um, common law and the jury system. So I just open that up. I can start playing. And so you can see, I didn't reset, but my students, they answered all the questions. Let me open up another one. Let me go back and reset and you can see what it looks like. And so here, my students will use head of the executive branch. They give me their possible answers. And they come up with the question, who is the president, right? And then all I have to do is go down here and click on the green and automatically the points go in. Because we know as teachers, we're doing so many things that it's hard to keep track of all the points. All right. Another one that I really like is, this is um, very fun because World Wall, Word Wall Net, if you don't know it, yeah, it's great, right? Yeah. And you can create that, you can create a bunch of activities. Um, I paid a little bit for it. I think I pay like $6 a month because it's just so useful. One of the things I like to start with in my class is this ESL wheel. <laughs> which um, and has some simple questions that the students will answer. Uh, what's important when we do these sort of open-ended tasks, maybe have them take notes uh, and you'll take this information and create a little Kahoot with it for the next day. This will help your students pay more attention to what their classmates are saying. And it gives them a reason to listen and a reason to speak well. So combining those two, so you've got your word wall and then you create a simple Kahoot with who, play, I've done that a few times, um, who likes to play ba basketball, for example. And then they have to remember their classmate's name. Um, another one that I like, I, I like this one. I just want it to be easier for me to get my students into it. Padlet, have you, have you guys used Padlet? So you do have, um, I hope I'm 
going into the right account. Because I have, okay, I have two accounts. This is my smaller account. <laughs> so uh, I taught Forrest Gump. And um, you can actually make copies of these Padlets and students can go ahead and uh, that they can find where Forrest Gump traveled in the book, right? Let me open up my, I want to open up my other one because it's, um, I can show you what my students have actually done. Okay. And again, having those, the, the language for the task will make this a lot better. Um, all right, let's go back and see if this will take me. Yes. Yay. All right. So here I have, so I've made, for example, different Padlets for my students, but let me show you the vocabulary that I did. Um, all right. That's not exactly what I wanted, but uh, we'll go with this one. Okay, no, now you're saying, oh, she only uses the map. No, no, I don't, I promise. <laughs> but I've used it in, okay, for brainstorming. I'm just looking for the different classes. Okay. So here I had them brainstorm about their story she didn't finish everything, but you can add pictures to it. You can have them uh, do a bulletin board. A friend of mine, I really like this idea. She gives them a uh, quotation. The group has to find the speech for the quotation. For example, I have a dream. Many people already know that came from Martin Luther King but they need to know where. So they have to have a picture of the, the mall in Washington, DC and why he gave this speech. And they'll have to write a little bit on that as well on the Padlet. Um, so the World Cup is, oh, it's looking like, I'm sorry, I wish I had better, uh, I have a, a better Padlets to show you right off. Um, and there is also using Google Slides, uh, making memory games. But when you have word wall, like Maria, you were nodding your head, like word wall is terrific. You can, you already have so many different activities you can create. You can create um, memory. So here I, there's, this is a, game on, uh, <laughs> sorry. So before I used to create very elaborate memory games using Google Slides and getting a background and then WordWall came into my life and they can just simply go number two and then number 25 and it's just terrific. So you can do it, you can create these activities for free, but then at some level, you'll, uh, you might want to pay like, I think it's $6 a month. If you use it a lot, it might be worth your while. Sorry for the jungle noises. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm trying to remember some, those are my, those are, the, those are the most common ones that I use. Oh yes, and I'm sure you guys know Quizlet, right? Yeah, Quizlet Live, Quizlet is great. Um, I like to use that, they get their vocabulary list, but then we need to take it to another level where we create those uh, interview questions, where they're creating, they're putting their ideas using the new vocabulary together. And, uh, but Quizlet is a great place for them to start. And Quizlet Live is fun. Um, so 20, that's like 
those are the ones I can think of. Those are the ones I use the most. If you guys have, I, um, have any that you would like to share, please help us all out. We're all teachers and we want, we want to share the love, you know? Any other great? I need to use the food in my classroom. My students love, love it, love it. <laughs> it's uh, so practical, useful for my classes. It's and they're easy, like, easy to make too, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I usually to use it. It's so super helpful to me in my classes. <laughs> Everyone should use. I believe so too. I'm a big Kahoot yeah. fan, just like you. Uh, also, it's so when, fun too, as well. It's so fun it, for them. It's really fun. And what one thing that I learned, and maybe Tuani, you already know this, that uh, let's say you're teaching. Um, okay, let's say uh, I'm teaching Number the Stars or Forrest Gump. I can, um, oh, I have to remember how to do this, but they have a, a, a question bank where they will give you questions already made. All you have to do is add, and I'm trying to, now I'm trying to remember how I did that, but you can search for the question bank and it will make writing the questions even easier. Ah, I want it. Forest, maybe let's Amazing. see. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, so no, I love I love it. Forest Gump. Let's see if uh, oh I I'll figure that out. I have a I'm doing a workshop on technology. <laughs> and Swani, I'm but you're making me think I need to I need to remember how to do that. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tuani. Thank you for talking. Thank you for getting on. Any other additions, any other helpful, helpful digital resources or techniques that you really like? That's okay, that's all right. Um, one thing I like to do is, and I do it even online, is I have my students usually complete a card when we're in class with their name, their country, their languages, uh, why are they studying English? Um, what's their favorite food? What's their favorite movie is usually my, because I love movies. And then I use the cards to help, to make sure all of my students get a chance to talk. So, you know, I I make sure I would have make sure that you me know. So I ask her question, or she has a moment to speak, and then I put her card aside so I know she has spoken, and then I can go Maria, and I can and I can go through Maki. I can go through and until all the cards are done, and then I can pick them up again, shuffle them so everyone feels included, and everyone gets a chance to speak. And that's a speaking technique that I really like because I want all my students to feel valued and that I, and I, and I learn all their names that way. It's really easy. Any other, so I'm going to let Lauren take over. She has a few words to share with you, but it has been a pleasure to talk to you. I hope that this was a, a helpful presentation for you. It was really delightful to be with you all today. Please remember that what we did is that we went over six guidelines for a successful speaking class. Um, we focused on four of them. We did our speaking activity with, um, with, the, with our table of uh, 20 questions. And thank you so much for your questions and adding you know, giving your information as well about what is best in for you, like Kahoot. Thank you, Tuani. Thank you so much. Thank so you. take it away, Lauren. <laughs> Have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy your weekend and thank you for coming.
Thank you, Allison. And yes, thank you again, everyone, for joining us for this workshop today. Um, I just have a little bit of information to share about our programs. And if you have attended our events before, I'm sorry, this is probably familiar information that you already heard. Um, but if this is your first time joining us, maybe this will be um, interesting for you. So um, I am going to share my screen. And um, I will show you a little bit of um, information about our TEFL programs. One moment, please. Okay, let's see here. And, okay, just loading on my side. Okay. So I hope you are all able to see my screen. Um, so again, uh, today we talked about teaching English as a foreign language. And uh, at the Division of Continuing Education, we have a lot more um, programs and courses that are available if you are interested in learning about this kind of material a little bit more. So our main TEFL program is called our Accelerated Certificate in TEFL. And that program we offer two times a year in the spring and fall quarters. So it's actually coming up very soon this fall. And this fall is a little bit special because we're actually going to offer it uh, what we call dual delivery. So the people who are physically in California can come to UCI's campus to take the classes in person. But if you're not able to come to the United States just yet, um, you can still join the program remotely uh, while you stay in your home country. So uh, that's a special thing that we're doing this fall. And then we also have a lot of free teacher training courses available on the website called Coursera. Um, our own TEFL teachers have created a lot of great content that's available on there for free. So you can definitely check that out. And then we'll also continue to have these free monthly TEFL workshops. So next month we'll have um, a different topic with another wonderful instructor. So if you have time, please feel free to join us. And we actually um, plan some more uh, events up until December. So that's our plan right now. And if we can, we will continue these events even next year too. And as always, if you have any questions about these programs or even ESL programs, or you want more information about today's uh, workshop, please email our team below uh, at the bottom, this email address ip at ce.uci.edu. And that is our main email address and I will stop sharing my screen and then the last thing is I mentioned that we'll have some upcoming uh, events and I will put that link oops sorry I'll put that link in the chat in one moment and copy paste Thank you, Allison. Okay. Okay, so the link that I just posted is for our upcoming events. So if you scroll down, you'll be able to see some that say ESL and others that say TEFL. So you can pick whichever ones that you're interested in. Um, and then one more link. <laughs> um, this one, the second one, is the link to see our recorded events um, from, from um, earlier this year, if you weren't able to join before. So please check those out too. Okay, so that is the end of my speech. <laughs> and we are actually ending on time, which is amazing. <laughs> um, thank you very much, everyone, again, for joining us. I know it's different times for everyone. Some it's at night, some people, it's very early morning. So thank you very much for um, spending time with us today. And thank you again, Allison, for um, really wonderful, uh, you know, and I learned a lot too, <laughs> wonderful uh, workshop. Um, if you have any questions, again, please feel free to email us and we hope to see you again at our future events. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of your weekend. Bye-bye, thank you.